introduction to, to the topic. Let me start with the paradoxes. Uh, perhaps one of the most famous paradoxes is that uh, the beginning of this, the Cretan said, all Cretans love. Okay, so, uh, so this is basically one version of, the, um, of, of this paradox, which could, which could be distilled into saying, uh, the paradoxical sentence here is, this sentence is false. Now what do you do with that? Uh, okay, obviously it's a logical paradox. If it's true, then its content must be the case, so it must be false, contradiction. But if it is false, then its content is obviously true, so it must be true, contradiction. What can you do? Uh, well, the, um, what people usually say, maybe there are different ways of thinking about that, um, what, the, uh, what the problem here is and how it gets resolved. <coughs> Uh, what people commonly say is that the statement doesn't have a truth value. Well, obviously, so truth value would mean to say it's true or it's false. Obviously, you can't do either. Um, uh, so, um, but people feel that there's not a problem because this is not an interesting sentence to begin with. So, um, the challenge here is more that any formalized system of logic, any way of teaching logic to computers, should be <coughs> Including uh, statements such as these from the class of meaningful statements. So, logical paradoxes, in the end, uh, are statements that that cannot be attributed to clear meaning. So, the paradoxes we are dealing with are often <coughs> not of this form. Um, uh, I, I, I thought whether there is a kind of uh, general classification of paradoxes, but maybe that's not <coughs> really necessary or relevant. The general pattern seems to be that a paradox provides a plausible argument for a statement A and another plausible argument <coughs> for the negation of A. So that's a bit similar to a dilemma. You would call something a dilemma if you have two statements, A and B, <coughs> and you know that one of them must be right, for example, because B is the negation of A, but there are plausible arguments against both. So you have to believe either in A or in B, but whichever one you choose, uh, there's uh, something bad about it, something you have to pay, something implausible that you have to accept. Um, now, if, if S, why don't we call it S? So that's a description of A. So the statement A here, um, so suppose we have a plausible argument for A and a plausible argument for non-A. If A is a meaningful statement, not a logical paradox, if it, if it has a truth value, then one of the two arguments that we have must be wrong. The challenge is find the mistake, or can you plausibly decide what the, um, which of A and non-A is actually true, and uh, <coughs> um, which is um, um, which was wrong. Now, um, this situation often amounts to a proof by contradiction showing that a certain assumption that you made in your arguments deriving A or, or deriving non-A or both um, must have been flawed. Here's an example of that. So this is a paradox from set theory. So let me start with a paradox that's not from quantum physics. Uh, Russell's paradox is the following. Let M be the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. So here's that notation. So uh, we take the set, that's what the curly brackets mean, of all those sets S that do not contain themselves as an element. <coughs> um, now, here's what's paradoxical about that. If, now you ask the question, does M contain itself as an element? Oh, if it does, then it doesn't fulfill the requirement for being a member of M, so it, so it should not contain itself, contradiction. But if it does not contain itself, then it does fulfill the requirement of being a member of the set M. So M should be an element of M, a uh, contradiction. So uh, these two contradictions could be understood in such a way as uh, a proof for M element M and a proof of M not element M. Uh, okay. You can't have both, obviously. Now, in these arguments, there's actually, well, these arguments are so so simple, there's no room for anything to be wrong in the argument. <laughs> so how can you resolve the par paradox? Well, actually, the, the crucial assumption when in, uh, the crucial assumption was that 
you can form such sets. So both arguments actually make use of the hidden assumption that for every assertion, um, a statement about a set S, such as S is not an element of S, an assertion that a set S may or may not satisfy, there exists a set of all sets S satisfying this assertion P. That is, here in formal notation, there exists such a set. Uh, so this is actually an assumption that uh, many of the early formalizations of set theory introduced as an axiom, because uh, you want to think about the set of all <coughs> um, uh, the set of all um, numbers that are greater than zero or something. The set of all things that satisfy a certain condition. <coughs> But this assumption exactly is refuted by the contradiction. Uh, this paradox shows that such a set simply doesn't exist. So we had to revise our idea of which kind of sets exist or, um, uh, or how you can introduce sets. Some paradoxes <coughs> are just surprising statements. And the only resolution uh, to this situation is that well, often they have the following structure. There's some argument leading to a conclusion, and the conclusion sounds impossible. The conclusion is against our intuition. <coughs> and in some of these cases, the resolution is simply that our intuition was wrong about it. <coughs> Here's an example of Brace's paradox. Um, that concerns uh, a road network. So let's say here's a road network. There are, uh, there are four towns called Start, End, A, and B. And there are roads between these towns. <coughs> and uh, a certain number of drivers every day, say 4,000, want to go from one place to another, say from start to end. Uh, <coughs> now, um, uh, one of these roads always takes 45 minutes. When you drive this, it's always 45 minutes. There's another road where the time it takes depends on how many people <coughs> take it. So if capital T is the number of drivers on this road, then you take capital T divided by 100, that's the time of minutes that it takes you to go this road. <coughs> okay, so depending on how many other drivers are there, you could be faster this way or that way. Well, forget the, uh, the dash tower for the moment. Okay, now, now come all these drivers. Every driver uh, will argue as follows. Okay, if, if I could either drive via A or via B, if via A is faster than via B, I will take that one. <coughs> so if there, um, if there are fewer drivers who take the, the A path than the B path, then I'm better off taking the A path. And in this way, a certain equilibrium will come up. It's called Nash equilibrium, <coughs> where actually um, both paths have the same, uh, take the same time. Because as long as they don't take the same time, some drivers will switch tomorrow to the other path. Okay, and it turns out when you, uh, when you do the computation, uh, the, the equilibrium time from start to end is 65 minutes. <coughs> now the government builds another road between A and B. And it's a fantastic road, it's a super fast road. You can go there at very high speeds. To go from A to B along this road takes basically zero minutes. It's negligible. Now that changes the situation. Now people could take this road, then go to B and take that road. <coughs> or the other way around. So <clears throat> then uh, <clears throat> you have to do a new kind of calculation of what the Nash equilibrium will be. And it turns out if every driver maximizes their time, then everybody in the end will have to drive 85 minutes. <laughs> you build a new road and it takes you longer than before. That sounds crazy, sounds paradoxical, and yet it's true. You just have to get used to it. <clears throat> it's it's something you wouldn't have expected, but that's the resolution of the paradox. There's nothing more to say. You assume that uh, having more roads would, uh, would make the traffic flow easier, but in the end, it's not true. <coughs> it does. Here's another example of this kind. <coughs> it's called the Banatarsky paradox. Um, it's, a, it's a theorem in mathematics, also it's in set theory. So Banatarsky gave a <coughs> proof of that statement. Consider the unit sphere in R3. It can be partitioned into 10 subsets. Partition means uh, a disjoint union. It can be written as a disjoint union of 10 subsets. And now there are certain 10 rotations such that these rotated sets, 
So you can take the set A1, rotate it in, in a way you want, A2 in a different way, and then you put them together again, uh, such that the, that the first five will, by themselves, form a partition of the unit sphere, and the other five will also form a partition of the unit sphere. Now that sounds completely impossible, you will argue, because a rotation preserves size, preserves volume on the sphere, so that means surface area. <clears throat> now if you, if you have these ten sets, and if they form a partition, then their surface areas have to add up to the surface area of the sphere. So, uh, now if you have five of them, rotating them doesn't change the area. So if you put them together, if they still form a partition, the first five of them, their areas add up to the uh, area of the sphere, and the other one as well. So that's impossible. You can't double the area. Um, now, this, uh, this reasoning, of course, assumes that, um, that these sets were measurable. Now, area is only defined for Borel sets as mathematicians say, uh, of, the, um, of the sphere, so-called measurable sets. But some sets are not measurable, the area is not defined for them. And here the trick is, of course, that these sets, the A1, A2, and so on, are non-measurable sets. Once you realize that, you see that kind of the, the contradiction is gone. And then, uh, then you may be ready to accept this counterintuitive fact that these sets actually exist. Now these sets are actually completely crazy sets. <clears throat> so if I if I show here something with my hands, that suggests that these these sets look like the shape of my hand. They do not. They're kind of completely crazy set that have points here, points there, uh, in a <clears throat> in a very wild fashion, as corresponds to measurable sets. You may know that uh, kind of most sets that you would usually think of are measurable sets, particularly the shape. of I should mention that this example is actually controversial because it used the axiom of choice. Some authors have, uh, have said that this, this conclusion is so counterintuitive that they would rather drop the axiom of choice. Um, I would say the opposite. Uh, once you see the proof of this statement, uh, it, uh, I would say you're convinced that the statement is true. And it's uh, counterintuitive to drop the axiom of choice. Good. So these are some paradoxes that we can compare our physics paradoxes to. Okay, paradoxes also come up in quantum mechanics, <clears throat> and, uh, but, but it's more than that. Paradoxes actually play a certain role in quantum mechanics, uh, particularly in the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which goes back to Niels Bohr. That is because Bohr's idea of complementarity has something to do with paradoxes. Let me explain. So now I brought myself into the situation of having to explain complementarity, which is uh, kind of a, a difficult thing to do. <clears throat> In fact, uh, here's a quote from Einstein. Despite much effort which I have expended on it, I have been unable to achieve a sharp formulation of Bohr's principle of complementarity. Bell comments into that, what hope then for the rest of us? If Einstein couldn't understand complementarity, then what chance do we have to understand? Uh, okay, let's go to Bohr's definition of complementarity. <clears throat> Let me quote, any given application of classical concepts precludes the simultaneous use of other classical concepts which in a different connection are equally necessary for the elucidation of the phenomena. Uh, so you, you get a taste here of Bohr's writing style, which is somewhat obscure, hard to understand. It's hard to understand what this even means. Uh, so let me, let me try to explain how I understand this statement. Um, let's say we want to compute a certain quantity of interest. For example, we have uh, uh, scattering, light scatters off an electron. We want to compute the, the wavelength that, that results. <clears throat> then, uh, the way, particularly the, the way people did it in early quantum mechanics in the 1920s, you use kind of two theories for doing the computation. Theory A, let's say classical theory of billiard balls, you have a kind of collision between two particles. 
and theory B, classical theory of waves. And then here's how people did the computation. Uh, they did part of the computation as if we were talking about waves, classical waves, and part of the computation. Then at some point we switched using the Broglie's relation between wavelength and momentum. And then we did part of the computation um, using the theory of the classical theory of billiard balls. And um, um, maybe that's what uh, I, I think that's what, or something that Bohr had in mind. Um, you, you have these two theories that actually contradict each other because one theory says, oh, it's a photon is a billiard ball, and the other theory says, no, it's a wave. But uh, for doing the computation, you use one theory, then you use the other theory, you use both of them as if they were part of the, um, of the same theory. But they're not. You're, you're actually, your argument, your reasoning for arriving at the value that you predict is actually self-contradictory. Um, it's part of the idea here, I think, that Bohr thought that it's impossible to find just one theory C that replaces both A and B and explains the whole physical process. Instead, we should just leave the conflict between A and B unresolved and accept the idea that reality is paradoxical. You see, if, if that is the view of quantum mechanics, then paradoxes play a crucial role. Here's another quotation from John Bell. So it's, uh, it's nice and, and very fitting that uh, John Bell is to, uh, we can give some quotations from John Bell, particularly because uh, Bell was, um, on, on the one hand, a kind of, um, a very sharp mind, uh, a deep thinker, and on the other hand, also had a writing style that is, I would say, quotable. He had nice ways of putting things. <clears throat> so here's a quote in which Bell explains complementarity. It seems to me, he wrote, that Bohr used this word with the reverse of its usual meaning. So usual meaning of the word complementary. Consider, for example, the elephant. From the front, the elephant is head, trunk, and two legs. From the back, to the bottom, tail, and two legs. From the sides, it's otherwise, and from top and bottom, uh, different again. These various views are complementary in the usual sense. They complement each other. They supplement one another, they're consistent with one another, and they're all entailed by the unifying concept of an elephant. So there is a coherent concept of an elephant that uh, from different perspectives just has these different appearances. It is my impression that to suppose Bohr used the word complementary in this ordinary way would have been regarded by him as missing his point and trivializing his thought. So Bell claims Bohr meant the opposite with the word complementary. He, Bohr, seems to insist, Rob, that we must use in our analysis elements which contradict one another, which do not add up to or derive from a whole. By complementarity, he meant, it seems to me, the reverse contradictoriness. So, to reiterate this last point in my own words, according to key elements of the Copenhagen view, reality itself is contradictory. And that is why there is no theory C, no single picture that completely describes reality. At the same time, according to Copenhagen, we can never observe a contradiction in our experiments. For example, we can only observe one of two complementary observables. If two observables uh, correspond to non-community operators, we can only do one of the experiments, not both at the same time. <clears throat> and that's why you don't see the contradictions. In your outcomes of experiments, everything is always consistent. And since we cannot observe contradictions, the contradictions are somehow not a problem. So don't worry about this, according to Bohr. Now, of course, you, you, you can't keep people from worrying, so people have worried about this. And um, so, uh, the, the, the situation, according to the Copenhagen view, 
is somewhat like in this Charles Adams cartoon. <clears throat> we don't actually see the paradoxical thing happen. We just see traces that must have happened. What we see is these traces of something impossible must have happened. In, in this picture, it's not quite clear whether this guy has actually seen the other skier pass through, or whether also he turned around too late, like, like we when we look at this picture. We only see it after the fact. We only see the traces, <coughs> which, um, uh, which to us are signs showing that something paradoxical must have happened. So, according to Copenhagen, some paradoxes just cannot be resolved. And this week, we would like to find out whether that is so. We want to get to the bottom of the paradoxes in quantum physics. And for this, we need to scrutinize theories, so uh, uh, <coughs> examine theories, claiming to be such a theory C, that is, claiming to resolve all the paradoxes quantum physics, claiming to be able to provide a single coherent picture of how the quantum world works. The leading theories of this kind are Bohmian mechanics, many worlds, and, uh, and collapse theories. The best known collapse theories is, theory is that of Girardi, Rimini, and Weber. So um, part of the thing we will do is to scrutinize how these theories work. We want to understand how these theories work what they can achieve and what they cannot achieve. So, uh, then, uh, in, in the end, it will also lead to the question, would you believe in the end that something paradoxical could be real? Uh, so here's, a, here's an analogy. So here's this painting by uh, Dutch artist M.C. Escher. Uh, of an impossible staircase. In this staircase, you always go up, you always go up, and then you arrive back at the point where you started, so you can go up forever. <coughs> uh, that's unpleasant for those figures going up, maybe nicer for those going down forever. Um, actually, uh, Michael Lacanilao, uh, who is visiting, uh, a fellow of the John Bell Institute who is visiting this week and who will arrive during the day today, um, uh, he's a, a filmmaker, and he tried whether he could convince people that such a staircase, where you go up, go up, go up, and then you arrive back at the point where you started, when that could be possible on Earth in reality. He tried whether he could convince people of that. Now, you would think that it's impossible to convince anybody of something impossible. Um, so what he did was he posted a video on YouTube that, um, that supposedly shows such a staircase. Uh, yeah, so you may want to watch this video. I put the link on the, um, on the web page of our school. And, well, you can talk to Michael during this week. <coughs> um, okay, let me... Um, Let's see, let me move to some more, uh, more technical parts. Um, I want to also say a few things to set the stage for uh, the other lectures. Uh, so I want to review a few technical things from quantum mechanics so everybody is on the same page and we know what we mean by these um, uh, these different uh, terminology and notation. And um, again, uh, please interrupt me anytime, ask questions if there's some notation or terminology you don't understand or you are not familiar with. Uh, I'll be happy to explain everything. So, on this slide, I've made a list of rules of quantum mechanics. The, uh, the set of rules that you use for making predictions in quantum mechanics. Uh, here I organize it in, um, in three rules, and these rules for um, predictions are basically universally accepted. Uh, so all the different views and different interpretations of quantum mechanics agree about these rules for making predictions. Uh, first rule, the wave function, oh, this is a misprint, this should be psi. The wave function of an isolated system evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. 
So here I wrote the Schrodinger equation. Uh, so in Hilbert space, that uh, represents a unitary evolution. So the, uh, the wave function as a vector in Hilbert space is kind of rotating in the sense of rotation in Hilbert space is a unitary evolution, as long as the system is isolated. Now, <coughs> then at some point, um, uh, suppose an observer makes a quantum measurement. All right, here for the for defining it, let me call an ideal quantum measurement because you could also consider imperfect measurement. <coughs> suppose an observer makes an ideal quantum measurement of an observable, which I call script A. All of these quantum observables are associated with self-adjoint operators on the Hilbert space. So here I wrote A for this operator, um, and um, let's say this operator can be written uh, in this way in the in its spectral composition. So here alpha means eigenvalues of the, um, uh, of the operator A. The sum is over all eigenvalues. Now in general for a self-adjoint operator you could have continuous spectrum. <coughs> so then you would have to replace the, the sum by, um, by an integral. And the eigenvalues would then, uh, well, the, the terminology of mathematicians it wouldn't be called eigenvalues, but general, generalized eigenvalues. Okay, but th these kind of uh, mathematical details are not relevant at this point. Let's assume there are uh, just finitely many eigenvalues. Then the p alphas are the projections to the corresponding eigenspaces. Okay, so this is the operator. We, an observer makes this measurement on a system with wave function psi. Then uh, the possible outcomes are the eigenvalues of A, and the, there's a probability distribution of these eigenvalues. Uh, by the way, the set of all eigenvalues is also called the spectrum of the operator, and the probability of a particular eigenvalue alpha would be the, the size, that means the norm squared of the projection of psi to this eigenspace, or this can also be written in this way. That's because the norm squared can be written as the, as the scalar product of the, of the spectrum with itself. So if you have the scalar product of um, P alpha psi with P alpha psi. And then it's uh, one of the properties of, uh, of several joint operators that we can move them to the other side, and it's one of the properties of projections that p squared is the same as p. Good. So these are two ways of writing these probabilities that will come up repeatedly. Um, did, uh, I, I let you go to the for too long. Um, thank you. And then the wave function collapses. So if you got the outcome alpha, then <coughs> the wave function gets replaced in this way here. Uh, the, the subscript means the time at which we are looking. So psi subscript t means you're considering psi at time t. t minus means uh, the, the left limit. So just before t, and t plus means just after t. So the wave function just after the measurement is the collapsed one. And uh, for collapsing, you can take the the wave function just before the experiment, so with the idealization that this experiment just appear, occurs in one instant of time and zero duration. So you project it to the eigenspace and then you normalize it again. So the, um, the denominator here is just a number, a normalizing factor. Good, so this is the, the set of rules that works well with, uh, with the vast body of uh, experiments. <coughs> And um, now, let me discuss a few general um, consequences of these rules. Some of them concern limitations to knowledge. <coughs> limitations to knowledge. Okay, <coughs> let me first give you an example, and then uh, I will try to say more generally what I mean by limitation to knowledge. <coughs> Or maybe let me say first that a limitation to knowledge means there's something you cannot know, something you cannot find out, although there is something to find out. So let me explain. Uh, the claim here is that in any version of quantum mechanics, you cannot actually measure the wave function. 
So the claim is that although the wave function <coughs> is there, it's an object somehow in nature, you cannot measure it. Uh, now, the argument that I will give does not actually prove that the wave function is really there, it just proves that you cannot measure it. Well, I guess in, in these cases that I discuss in the argument, <coughs> uh, it also follows that the wave function is actually there, that nature knows what the wave function is, but it's not a, uh, an argument showing in general that wave functions, that nature always knows what wave functions are. So here's the example. Say there, <coughs> uh, that there are two people, Alice and Bob. I'm, I'm sorry, Alice, you will serve as the as an example here this week many times. So <clears throat> Alice chooses a direction A in space and prepares a spin one half particle in a particular quantum state, the spin up state in direction A. <clears throat> now, so there is this physical particle with this spin state. This spin state, this particle, I should say, she hands over to Bob, and Bob's task is to determine what the wave function is. Uh, well, the relevant part of the wave function here is the spin state. <clears throat> Bob tried to measure the spin state, or tried to find out what, which, which direction was this A. Okay, so now according to the rules of quantum mechanics, Bob, I should quickly press something. Bob can do no better than do a quantum measurement of some observable. So he can, he can measure the spin in some direction, for example, in the Z direction. Okay, he will do a Stern-Galloff experiment, uh, yeah, we will have uh, uh, a later lecture, uh, a lecture tomorrow discussing the Stan Galloff experiment in detail, a lecture by Matthias. <coughs> um, so, uh, so Bob chooses a, a direction B, for example, the Z direction, does this uh, uh, ideal quantum measurement of sigma Z, the, uh, uh, the Pauli matrix in the Z direction, and he obtains one bit of information, up or down, plus or minus one. Now, from one bit of information, he's supposed to figure out which among all infinitely many directions A was. Well, obviously, that's impossible. What he can actually do is, uh, <coughs> uh, um, well, if, uh, if you got the result up, then he can actually say, oh, it's, it's more probable <coughs> that A is in the upper hemisphere than that A is in the lower hemisphere. And <coughs> he can quantify that, he can do a calculation figuring out what these probabilities actually are. But uh, he's in no position at all to, to say which vector A actually was. <coughs> now, <coughs> if the game is repeated, and Alice always prepared the same quantum state, the same direction, and Bob has many copies of the same quantum state, then he can do many things. He can, uh, he can measure all sorts of spin observables, and from this, um, all this data together, he will be able to conclude uh, with arbitrary precision if he has enough copies what this vector A was. <coughs> but not in a single run. In a single run, he has just one bit of information. And for this single particle, he just cannot measure the wave function. But at the same time, nature knows what the wave function is. Uh, for example, because Alice knows. Alice has chosen this direction, prepared this exact spin state. So there's no doubt that there is a fact about what the spin state is in nature. So the conclusion here is that, um, uh, that there is some fact out there in the world, in nature, that we cannot discover by doing any experiment whatsoever. Yes, so if one question, in which sense can I just prove it? Uh, she knows what the direction was, yeah. so what she can do is uh, before Bob does uh, any experiment, <coughs> she can say, okay, now maybe we will do this, uh, this game over and over, and now for this particular run, I, I can prove that I know what the, what the spin state is, and I do it in the following way. I will review which direction I chose. So in this case, I chose that direction, um, and Bob can test it by doing the Stangala experiment in this direction, and Alice makes the prediction that the result will always be up, and they can try several times, and okay. Bob finds it's, it's always, okay. that, that uh, Alice's prediction is always true. But, in, but to really prove it, they would need to still try it many, many times. Yes, because they do it many, many you know, times. She could just have been back here. She can yes. say, I prepared it. And yes. It and, and then, according to the, the, the rules of quantum mechanics, the only way 
how Alice could be right all the time. Make the, so what they find is that Alice made the correct prediction all the time, <clears throat> and the only way she can do it is by actually giving, telling Boss yeah. the, the, the yeah, correct prediction. Yeah. My point is not, not in a single run. This, this was my question. Yes, yeah, you, you can't prove, prove it for a single yeah. run. Um, and, but the, the reasoning would be if statistically Alice is always right, then kind of there's no other way of doing it than uh, um, than having this. Um, um, g giving the correct information, and <clears throat> there is no other way for nature uh, doing this than um, than uh, remembering what the quantum state is. So, for example, if you w wanted to do this all in a simulation on your computer, then your computer would have to uh, keep a record of what the quantum state was in every single case. So, in this sense, uh, we could then argue that nature knows what the quantum state. Nature knows and Bob doesn't. <clears throat> and that's what I mean by um, a limitation to knowledge. That certain variables have well-defined values in the world, values known to nature, although we cannot measure them, even with all future technological advances they will not have. Uh, that actually sounds a bit shocking, limitations to knowledge, for the following reason. They may seem to conflict with some principle of science, perhaps, which could say something like, a statement is unscientific or even meaningless if it cannot be tested experimentally. Or likewise, an object is not real if it cannot be observed. Or likewise, a variable is not well-defined if it cannot be measured. It seems like, it feels a bit like, this is one of the principles of science, <coughs> of, of principle that, that we always use when making science. And <clears throat> now, um, now the, the idea of uh, limitations to knowledge runs counter to this, to this principle. So um, now let me say this is one of the things that we need to get used to. Limitations to knowledge are actually a fact of quantum mechanics. So the example that I just gave you uh, just proves the existence of limitations to knowledge. So, <clears throat> um, so maybe we need to revise our feeling that this is uh, how science should proceed, that this is one of the principles of science. And th so I would say this, this principle that I formulated here is actually not a principle at all. It's wrong. I just disproved it. And this is kind of an exaggerated form of positivism. Positivism means the idea that um, um, uh, that you should um, that that science should focus on claims that are testable, on variables that are measurable, things like that. So, kind of a, a, a pure form of positivism would be expressed by this kind of uh, thought, and. Um, so that is exaggerated. That is not good advice for physics, I would say. <clears throat> Maybe a, a certain dose of positivism <clears throat> is, is healthy. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's, it's a good idea to think, uh, before I start believing that perhaps there are, there are ghosts uh, in, in, in a certain castle, I, I want to see hard evidence that there are are ghosts. <clears throat> I want to see testable um, uh, evidence. Okay, I have a few more remarks about uh, uh, limitations to knowledge. So limitations to knowledge are basically unknown in classical physics. That is why we're often not, uh, not used to the idea, but they are actually very common in quantum physics. So here's another example of a limitation to knowledge. Uh, consider a uh, Hilbert space, let's say for simplicity two-dimensional, or could be spin space again, and let's consider two orthonormal bases of the Hilbert space. So here the, the upper index will distinguish the two bases, and the lower index will count the vectors, the members of the bases. And <clears throat> now, um, now uh, Alice, it's your turn again. So Alice chooses uh, one of these two bases. <clears throat> Uh, either, either this basis or that basis, I have a choice, let me call it R. 
then she prepares an ensemble of 50% uh, particles. So ensemble means many particles, 50% of them uh, with the wave function given by this state vector and the other 50% given by the, uh, the other basin vector as the state vector. Okay, so some of them have this and some of them have that state vector. Now these particles are handed over to Bob, who is asked to determine which of the two bases had his chose. So he's asked, uh, is it A or B? The claim, the first formulator of the claim is, uh, the claim is, oh, you can't distinguish between these two ensembles. You cannot find out empirically, whatever experiment you do, you cannot find out which of the two ensembles it actually is. The two ensembles are empirically indistinguishable. Um, uh, so this is another example of a limitation to knowledge. So there is a fact in reality about which ensemble is the right one, whether in reality the ensemble is A or B. That's because, well, Alice prepared it. Let's say Alice, in the end, keeps track of which particle actually has which state vector, how she prepared each particle. <clears throat> so there's a fact about uh, whether she prepared them 50% this way, 50% that way, or whether she prepared them 50% this way and 50% that way. Good. So in nature, there's a fact about um, which ensemble it is, <coughs> but Bob cannot find out. Uh, now let me say a few words about how to prove that Bob cannot find out. So what Bob could do is he could uh, carry out an ideal quantum measurement of some observable, and the, <clears throat> the different possible outcomes would correspond to projection operators. So, now for every projection operator, Bob's probability of the corresponding outcome, let me just write P as a shorthand for P alpha. Um, so, here's the probability that he gets. So for 50% of the particles, or uh, the, the frequency in the ensemble. For 50% of the particles, uh, they are phi i1. If you do the, this experiment um, with the, uh, a particle in state phi i1, the probability of getting the result yes, plus one, is this here. And now you have to average it. Uh, it after doing the calculation, it's one half trace of p. Trace of p for a projection is the, just the dimension of the subspace you're projecting to, so one half the dimension. <coughs> ah, in this case, let's see. Ah, oh, the the um, oh, I think because uh, I just went to get a uh, uh, power cable. <coughs> okay, let's let's hope that um, it will do a few more minutes. Good. Uh, so in this case, uh, when the uh, when the uh, Hilbert space has dimension two, I guess all the interesting uh, uh, projections have uh, um, rank one. That is the dimension of the of the space it projects to is one. So this would just be one. Okay, thank you. And um, now the, the 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 question also arises. I said uh, this is how um, <coughs> um, uh, okay, so the, the point here is that the expression on the right hand side now we somehow change the, the view of this. Okay, we do it like this. <coughs> um, but this doesn't depend on I anymore, it's the same for the two ensembles. Now um, uh, here I assume that Bob is doing an ideal quantum measurement. You might worry that uh, uh, we, we should be more general than that, not just ideal measurement. Any experiment. Can you prove it for any experiment whatsoever that Bob could do? Uh, the answer is yes, you can do that. <coughs> and for the general reasoning, you would need problems. That means positive operator value measures. Uh, actually, during this week at, at several points, I will, uh, I will say something about problems. So they're kind of a more advanced concept, a kind of generalized concept of observable. <coughs> now, if you do the same thing for um, for a general ensemble, 
Uh, so the two ensembles that I looked at were just 50-50 for different, um, uh, often on the basis. A general ensemble would correspond to any probability distribution of the unit sphere in Hilbert space. So the points on the unit sphere in Hilbert space would represent the possible wave functions. <coughs> An ensemble could have any distribution over wave functions. Now, say, as choose is some distribution over wave functions. Uh, <coughs> uh, so you could imagine a sphere, and now you have any probability distribution of a sphere. <coughs> so let me write mu for this probability distribution. That could be a discrete or continuous distribution or a combination of both. Now, now in that situation, if you uh, carry out an ideal quantum measurement, say just of this projection P, so your possible outcomes are plus one and minus one, then the, uh, the probability of outcome plus is given by this formula. If you have a particular quantum state psi, this would be the probability of getting the outcome plus. Uh, that's the formula that we have over here. <coughs> now you have to average this uh, with this probability distribution mu. So this notation means, oh, you're integrating over the, the unit sphere in Hilbert space, and you're using the measure mu, and that's how you, uh, uh, how you express the, the size of any volume element or surface element deep sauna on the unit sphere. <coughs> now, after a few lines of computation, you can express this quantity here as the trace of p times rho, where rho is this <coughs> operator here, and this operator is called the statistical density matrix. So part of the reason why I'm discussing this is to, uh, to show you the, the definition of the density matrix. Again, to make sure we're on the same page, <coughs> we know um, what definition we're talking about. <coughs> so this is the average of the one-dimensional projection as the average of different sides. Now, when you have, sorry, just yes, yeah, sure. So this is a diagonal form of density matrix. No, it's not. No. So what happens here is uh, just the side side is um, uh, that's of course a, a one-dimensional projection. Yes. Okay, now you average over, over all possible psi of the unit sphere. Oh, okay. So they're not orthogonal to each other. They could be, it could be a continuous distribution of the sphere. Okay. Okay, or, or it could be several non orthogonal vectors. Let's see. So here is a sphere, let's say. And let's say, put here various points, my different psi. Now I get different. The psi psi will be the projection operator. Now I have slightly different projection operators. I average them. <coughs> okay. So this, um, the different psi's that contribute, they're not orthogonal here. So <coughs> also this uh, this matrix will in general not be diagonal. Um, now now consider two different ensembles, mu and mu prime. Uh, so that a uh, reasoning that's analogous to what I had on the previous slide and leads to the following conclusion. <coughs> Two ensembles, mu and mu prime, are empirically distinguishable if and only if, uh, I will often write IFF for if and only if, if and only if they have the same density matrix. So if the, uh, if the density matrix rho prime, which is the analog of this expression for mu prime, you just replace mu by mu prime, then you get rho prime, and rho is the density matrix associated with mu. If the two density matrices are equal, if the two distributions have the same density matrix. <coughs> uh, here's an example. If you have 50% this and 50% that, then the associated density matrix is one half the identity. Here's another example. Consider a uniform distribution of the unit sphere. <coughs> so not as in this case, a uniform distribution then uh, yeah, you can easily com conclude from symmetry arguments that the density matrix has, actually has to be uh, a multiple of the identity operator. In fact, one over the dimension times the identity operator or identity matrix. So this matrix has one over D everywhere on the diagonal. Your D is the dimension of the Hilbert space. So in my previous example, that would be <coughs> two. So it would be the same density matrix as here. So, uh, so these two ensembles are 
uh, indistinguishable and the uniform distribution is again indistinguishable from them. Uh, now, an operator on the Hilbert space can occur in this way as a statistical density matrix if and only if <coughs> it's a positive operator, that means its spectrum lies in the non negative numbers, or the eigenvalues of rate are equal to zero, in other words, <coughs> and it has trace one. Actually, the uh, positive, this is sometimes called positive semi definite in the literature, so it also allows eigenvalues zero. <coughs> So the statement here is, if you have such an operator, you can find mu for which this form reproduces the operator that you want. <coughs> such an operator is called a pure density matrix if it is the one-dimensional projection, otherwise it's called mix. A pure density matrix will arise in this way only if the whole, <coughs> the whole probability distribution is concentrated on just one state vector uh, perhaps up to up to phase, you could have a random phase because the phase <coughs> cancels out when you form this expression. Now there's another type of density matrix, a reduced density matrix. So let me add a few words about that. Now you consider a composite quantum system, <coughs> a system that consists of uh, two parts, two sets of particles. You have the A particles and the B particles. So the set of all particles is the union of the A particles and the B particles. And the Hilbert space will be the tensor product of the A Hilbert space and the B Hilbert space. <coughs> Good. In the simplest case, you could think of just the A as one particle, B as another particle, we have two particles in total. <coughs> now, suppose Bob can make experiments only on the A system. For example, because A and B are on different planets, <coughs> and Bob is stuck on one planet. <coughs> And then for all of his, <coughs> I'm sorry, for all of his uh, ideal quantum measurements, what he can do, uh, all these uh, uh, spectral projection operators are of this form of projection, tensor product, with the identity on the, <coughs> on the B system, or on the B Hilbert space. Actually, this uh, is kind of a mathematical way of saying that he cannot act in any way on the B system. Now, in such a situation, the following happens. The probability of Bob obtaining a particular outcome alpha then is of this form. This is the, the projection operator associated with alpha. <coughs> it, it acts trivially, which means not at all, on the B system. And uh, you have this usual formula. Now, again, uh, after some uh, calculation, you can rewrite it <coughs> in this form. You can write it as the trace of P alpha times an operator rho, where rho is the following operator, it's, the, it's called the reduced density matrix, and you obtain it by taking the partial trace of psi to psi. Uh, that means the following for any operator S, the partial trace is the operator whose, um, whose matrix elements, so here I'm using some basis phi, the matrix elements I and J of this operator, are computed in this way. You form the matrix elements of the operator S with some basis for A, some basis for B, and then you sum over the diagonal entries with respect to the B basis, as you would for, uh, for computing a trace. Okay, so in this way, you get an operator that acts only on the A Hilbert space. So this row is an operator on the A Hilbert space, not on the full Hilbert space, the P alpha is also an operator just on the A Hilbert space. So, and this trace is a trace in the A Hilbert space. Good. <coughs> um, and that's called the reduced density matrix. You could say you've traced out the B system. <coughs> Good. Now, an operator on the A Hilbert space can occur as a reduced density matrix if and only if it is positive and has trace one. So again, it's the same class of operators which are called just density matrix. So the statement here is, if you have such an operator, you can find a psi <coughs> which gives you back the operator you want after taking the partial trace. At least <coughs> if uh, B has sufficiently high dimensions. Again, such an operator is called pure if it's a one-dimensional projection and mixed otherwise, despite the fact that in this situation, we're actually not talking about any mixture. Nothing is mixed here. There's nothing random. We just have this 
uh, this wave comes from psi for the whole system, for the big one, A and B together. <coughs> and now we're talking about um, uh, rules for uh, computing the probabilities for the A system alone. Yes, please. Okay, but, um, this is controversial, right? Whether there exists those real mixtures or not. Because in your other example, where this Alice prepares 50% in this basis, 50% in this basis, and you said that this would be a real mixture, if I understand. Yes, sure. yes. It could also be the case that her ensembles are entangled with the device that she used to create them. And that if you look at the whole system, her, her device was creation of those ensembles, then you, you get a pure state again. And because you only look at the reduced systems, you have mixtures. So whether there's really a difference between this type of mixtures and the other ones, is, would you say it's an open question? Or would you say? No, 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 I wouldn't. So I, I wouldn't go so far to say it's controversial. But I, I would, uh, um, it, it, it's something that, um, uh, that we should and that we will talk about more okay. this week. And it's something that people are talking about. Um, yeah, perhaps I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's controversial. Okay. Okay. And that's all I want to say from this perspective. Thank you very much. So this is 
very much inspired by uh, the, the liar paradox. It's a kind of um, modified in a, in a smart way, and it's, it's something that is certainly not um, uh, not excluded by the rules that magicians set up for excluding paradoxical statements. And in fact, the, the statement itself is not paradoxical. It doesn't say this sentence is false. It says this sentence is not provable. And then when you analyze what, what follows from that, and as he could prove uh, as kind of rigorously as uh, uh, something about, uh, about natural numbers, that <coughs> uh, in fact, either your, uh, your rules will make it possible to draw incorrect conclusions, will derive false sentences, or it will not be able to derive this sentence. Okay, so this is uh, kind of yeah, but I don't recall it was this. I recall it was uh, that he, he proved that there was a paradox. If you stayed in one system of actions, I mean, that's uh, he, he proved, wait, wait, wait. Uh, he proved that it was right and he proved that it was false. And I, I saw it with the phrase, wait, 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 I am, you, I am, I am, uh, what, this phrase is false. You, you have to be careful there. So, um, uh, he proved that either uh, is, uh, <clears throat> so, so any any given system for uh, uh, for deriving statements about natural numbers will either be inconsistent, so you will be able to derive contradictions, or there will be sentences that you cannot that are true, but you cannot derive them from these axioms with these rules. <clears throat> so the particular system that he had in mind was a system that was. Uh, kind of set up by uh, by uh, magicians, particular, uh, particularly Russell and Whitehead. They had this, this system called Principia Mathematica, <coughs> uh, and then uh, then they they wrote a, a thousand page book about how to, to derive all the the the, uh, the familiar statements from these axioms. And I think on page two hundred something they derived that one plus one is equal to two. Okay, and, uh, and so. Um, Gödel had a particular system um, in mind, or a, a, a particular example of such a system at hand, uh, and wanted to make sure that his proof also applies to this system. Now this system, <coughs> all, the, all the axioms are true statements, all the rules are, uh, are logically correct, so uh, you can only infer true statements from these axioms. And for this system, then, the consequence of Gödel's proof is that Gödel has an example of a statement about natural numbers that cannot be proved or disproved from the Russell Whitehead Principia Mathematica system. Yeah. So, um, so can, can we um, suppose that it's the same for all paradoxes? That's because uh, what follows in Gödel's demonstration is that uh, can uh, solve this issue by adding an action, an action each time, and this for an infinite number of actions. Ah, this okay. is one revolution. Ah, okay, so uh, the, the problem here, okay, so in a sense you could say that the problem here is not so much a paradox, uh, so the, um, the, the Principia Mathematica, this, the Russell Whitehead system, is not uh, <coughs> paradoxical. It, it doesn't allow to derive contradictions, but it's incomplete. You don't get all the true <coughs> theorems. Uh, so what can you do? Uh, it's, it's a good <coughs> show, gave an example of a statement that cannot be derived, <coughs> but which actually is true. What you could do is you could add that as another axiom, <coughs> but then kind of Gödel's method would allow you to set up another statement <coughs> from this uh, enlarged set of axioms that is true but cannot be proved and so on. <coughs> so you could do this hierarchy and generate more and more of these statements. Now you could think you take all of these statements, but I'm not sure whether, even if you take all of these statements, whether you would be able to um, then to cover all true statements about natural numbers. I think you're not. Well, the answer to that would be that we, can, we cannot found mathematics on axioms. We have to found it on something more foundation and it's reality. You have to find it on physics. Uh, I, I would agree that you can't found it on, on these um, um, 
uh, schemes that you can teach for computers. Uh, I would say I wouldn't uh, want to found it on physics because uh, physics is controversial, and, and we would have the idea that even if physics were different, the mathematics would be the same. So I would prefer to found it on, say, the, the meaning of the concept of natural numbers or something. So maybe we uh, can continue with this topic uh, <coughs> during the break and also have other questions. Or, or yeah, one quick question. So you said you, there are true statements that cannot be proved. Yes. What, what is a true statement then? If I, uh, how, how do you uh, okay. So this is a, 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 a bit similar to this yeah. question of positivism versus realism. So in, in physics, the positive Positivist would say, oh, something <coughs> is a, a, a variable is well defined if I can measure it. Uh, now uh, we we heard about limitations to knowledge, so uh, um, maybe we have to take a, a different position and uh, imagine the possibility that uh, a variable could have a well defined value but not be measured. So now there is a similar situation in mathematics: uh, true and provable. Okay, so uh, there are also positivists in, in mathematics. They call themselves formalists, and uh, the leading formalist was David Hilbert, actually, the guy uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> um, uh, whose name the Hilbert space carries. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so he had the idea that um, all the foundation of mathematics is by, uh, well, we agree on some set of axioms and some set of rules, and then everything else is like uh, playing chess, that's all that um, mathematics means. You apply certain rules to certain statements. And to be true means to be provable. And, um, um, but Gödel had a different idea. He was not uh, a positivist. He was a realist about mathematics. These people are called Platonists. Uh, so Platonists believe that um, there are facts about mathematics, no matter if you can prove them or not. So maybe maybe we're we're not smart enough to prove everything. Maybe there are very complicated facts about mathematics, um, uh, like uh, I, I don't know. It's it's not so easy to come up with a, with a good example. <coughs> so um, uh, and then basically, Gödel's proof is an example provides an example of a statement that is true but not provable provable with a particular um, particular method of proof or a particular system with a particular set of rules. Now it sounds a bit paradoxical. How can you know something is true if it's not provable? Oh, here's how. Um, we actually understand something about the meaning of certain concepts that allows us to conclude that certain things must be true, although this conclusion is not one that you can uh, you can repeat just using the rules. So in particular here, um, uh, the question is whether these axioms of, um, of Russell and Whitehead are, are consistent, whether they're contradiction-free. And now the way we know they're contradiction-free is we read all these axioms, we understand their true statements about natural numbers, and then we're convinced they're contradiction-free because we, we believe there is no contradiction in uh, about the natural numbers. We believe that the, that the concept of natural numbers is coherent. But the proof um, that, um, uh, that Principia Mathematica is, uh, is contradiction-free is actually something that cannot be done using the rules of Principia Mathematica. So that's another surprising conclusion of this proof. Yes. Uh, when you say limitations to uh, knowledge, as uh, uh, what I understand from the slides, uh, is it more in quantum mechanics about um, uh, distinguishing different uh, quantum states, like uh, uh, if they are unique or not, or is it in like in more general sense? Because uh, there has been a thing like we need new physics because quantum gravity we are not able to explain it using we are not able to reconcile quantum mechanics and GR. So maybe we need new physics. Uh, so you are your your that statement about the limitations of knowledge. Is it limited to uh, the microscopic quantum world, or like in general you are saying? Yes, it, it's not necessarily limited yeah. in, in this way. So I'm just presenting. Uh, I have just presented examples of limitations to knowledge. Now you can think of uh, uh, 
Um, well, it's not a very sharp concept. You could ask, um, are there other examples of limitations to knowledge? Presumably there, there are many examples. For example, in general relativity, you cannot look inside a black hole. So if you believe that, uh, say, your friend uh, is going on a spaceship and is falling into a black hole. Now, after crossing the horizon, presumably something is still happening inside the, the spaceship. They, well, after a while they reach the singularity and maybe their history just ends there. But between crossing the, singular, crossing the horizon and reaching the singularity, they still have some amount of time and maybe something is happening in there, but we will never know because we, we can't see from outside, they can't send any, any signals, about any messages about what's happening inside. Um, so that seems like another limitation to knowledge. Um, there, there, there could be limitations to knowledge that may make it impossible for us ever to find the, um, the true theory of uh, physics, the, the, uh, the theory of everything. I don't know. This would be imaginable, yes. So there could be, this could be kind of uh, um, a concept with, or an idea with many applications. Or it, it could be, uh, there could be many different kinds of limitations to knowledge in physics. Um, uh, how do you accidentally choose um, orthonormal bases for a quantum state or a quantum system? How do you do that Yeah, you could, for example, do a Stangela experiment. Um, so you would uh, choose a particular orientation of your magnet, and then this, uh, the, ma uh, the magnet would uh, split up the, uh, any wave packet into a part that has spin up in, in this direction, in this space direction, and spin down. And then in Hilbert space, the spin up and spin down, they would be orthogonal um, directions in Hilbert space. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you, th then you can, um, well, you can maybe choose one of the two wave packets or, or use them both. So then in this way, you could generate these um, orthogonal vectors. So it depends on the orientation of the, of the magnet? Yes. So you have different orientations of the magnet would then correspond to different orientations of the bases in human space. I don't think there was, yeah. Um, I have a question on the limitations of knowledge as well, on um, sudden phrasing. So um, when you were talking about the wave function, you, uh, to me it seemed like you were conflating measurement with knowledge. So basically, so for example, I can say that Rodi and Nafu are having a conversation like that. And I, so the statement is true, but I can't use quantum form, formalism to make sense of the statement that I just made that we are having a conversation because words like conversations and people have no notion in, like, when you're talking about state records and Hilbert space. So similarly, when you're talking about measurement, does it even make sense to say like what it means to measure the wave function because measurement only applies to quantum operators, so should we even be asking that just because you can't measure the wave function, that means you can't know anything about it? Because the particular nature of the wave function is just a unitary evolution forwards and backwards in time. Yeah, so I, I try to set up uh, the, the situation, the example, in such a way that at least in this particular example, uh, we know uh, precisely what the, um, what the task is for, for Bob. So Alice has chosen a particular direction, and, the, um, and uh, Bob is asked to figure out which direction it was. So uh, this is kind of uh, then a way of um, making precise what we mean by measuring the wave function. Uh, um, so um, Alice knows what the right answer is, and <coughs> but she doesn't tell Bob, and Bob should somehow figure out from his experiment what the answer is, and then when Bob gives him the answer, Alice can say that's right or not. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. How about the time? Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe one more question, and then we'll have a break. Um, so it's about. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, it's about. And as you said, we cannot measure the wave function uh, directly. We cannot have a measure of it. But uh, what do you think of the weak measures? Don't you think it's measuring the wave function? Um, maybe, at least in, in some cases. Um, well, in, in this particular example that I described, um, 
but the conclusion was that there you can't measure the weight function. Now, with, with weak measurements, um, uh, let's see, with weak measurements, you, um, you usually consider a situation where you repeat something over and over. You get the same wave function many times. Uh, Alice prepares uh, a thousand particles all with the same wave function, and then you do some experiments with that, and then you do some statistical considerations of your results. <coughs> um, I'll have to think about that, but I think what happens is that uh, um, what, you, what you study with weak measurements is these statistics of many experiments all with the same wave function. Now, in, in this example, it, 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 that was a crucial distinction, whether you have many particles all with the same wave function or just one particle, and you're asked to, uh, to find out the wave function of this one particle. If you have many particles with the same wave function, then you can also do it kind of uh, in the, uh, with, with ideal quantum measurements. Uh, you can uh, do different measurements on different particles of your ensemble and then draw different conclusions on what, the, uh, what this wave function must have been. Just a comment maybe. So I think that at least some papers claim there that when you do this, for example, this weak state, the direct state tomography using weak measurements, then you, you, you meet many systems, but you measure somehow directly the complex amplitude of the wave function without projecting onto, onto, onto a basis and measuring probabilities and then using this to reconstruct the wave function. But you somehow get from this complex weak value directly something that is something, as they claim, closer related to the really complex amplitude of the wave function. So therefore, maybe you measure directly the wave function, but you still need many copies. So you still cannot obtain the wave function from any single number. So maybe let's stop here. Let's um, move to the to the terrace for uh, 20 minutes.